nanoparticles on germination and, and allocation of roots in plants. We also want to make sure that we use and, and analyze um, green chemistry when we apply it into making nanoparticles. Particularly, my interest now is working with uh, bio, uh, biomimicry, which is really interesting how molecules can actually imitate other molecules. And I'm really finding uh, that out in, in one of uh, those nanoparticles, which is really interesting. And we also want to see how we can apply nanoparticles to understand our uh, organisms like uh, bacteria, fungi. And one part that is really unique is looking for the ways that, that, that we can develop digital resources, that we can put information that can be used in building research questions and, and information, because what we just want to do is put all the information in such a way that a student can go in based on a particular topic, and it will show all the researches that had, are, are being done, uh, the history, what was used, protocols, and things like that. So it puts um, the information easier for the students to actually work with lead review. So I think it, it's really one uh, of the ideas we've been working on. So as examples of how we actually do this and what we have done, we said what uh, particular project, in, in this case, we just wanted to look at the impact of nanoparticles on plant growth and development. And then we divide these uh, particular projects in individual topics and we assign students to actually work with those topics within this particular project. Here, I just want to tell you a story. Ryan is now an MD student and a PhD student as well. Ricardo is a PhD in biochemistry. He actually did it last year, and he is now in his postdoc in Houston, Texas, in, in, in the MD Anderson uh, Hospital. Excellent. And Agnes is an MD. She's doing uh, her residency in Texas. Well, I met Ricardo and Agnes in my biology first year class. They fell in love somehow between nanoparticles and roots. They fell in love and they are married, happily married for out of three years now. So the miracle of all the outcomes of good research, we can include that, no? Then we have uh, this uh, particular project was really interesting because the students here were making what we call functionalization. They take a nanoparticle and they attach that in this case with plant hormones and aspirins. And they could use it in what we call drug delivery, which is really interesting. Two students here, Gabby is in a, a medical school in Indiana uh, University, and so is Miguel. Uh, Gabby finishes now this year, and Miguel is in his uh, third year. So, very, very good students. This last one here, we wanted to work with digital res uh, resources. And we have students from computer sciences working in biology. I had a student in one of my general biology classes. He sat always in the front of the room, quiet. When I gave the first exam, his grade was incredible, I said, and he's from computer science. I gave the second exam, he came out good. I said, I need to talk to him. So we started a conversation, and next year, he joined my research group. And he designed the website. But 
He graduated and then he still worked in art. So we're still looking for the opportunity that he could develop this uh, career. It's not easy to actually find good uh, services that we could have at that level, provide all the uh, information in a di uh, digital manner. And he is really great in integrating all that. So uh, he's still working with that, okay? We have a total, as I say, six individual projects and we are covering 13 topics. Well, here I just wanted to uh, let you know that I don't do this alone. <laughs> I have partners working with me. Um, I have Dr. Osorio and Ferrer, Raquel in computer science, Lourdes in uh, microbiology. And one thing has been really interesting, our lab technicians has been an incredible resource. Sometimes we take for granted people that have years of experience and they have been incredible in training, particularly in the use of instruments in the care and management, absolutely great. So when I started thinking about what I was working with, I came up with a way to design my own model, I say. I said, well, let me make a model so I can follow this. And look, I'm following you, uh, the arrow that you actually use. Because we start at one point where we try to train our students in doing problem solving. And we escalate over time until we come at the end with some strategies that will show some actions on how the students are going to communicate research. But let's take a quick look. I'm not going to read all of it, but just uh, briefly tell you what we have done. For each one of those steps, I have designed modules where I tell my students and I try to follow this. They meet with me and we start talking about uh, research issues. I like the idea that the students relate not only to the R, but that they can go out of here and see what's, what's really going on in Europe, what is going on in the United States. So they can have an idea of where they can fit within what's going on. And it helps them to understand and start what I call the ownership of their own idea. So here they are going to start making analysis. They're going to start understanding exactly what research is all about, and they start learning to analyze and think about things. And particularly if what they are thinking about has some interactions, how I can put this within others to talk that they can have around. Once I keep having those meetings with them, then we could move into module number two. Here, they are gonna start learning to write their research questions and literature review. Well, the students can take with well, my students at least in general biology the first year. I give them a training of how to look for uh, journals and books in the library. I take them and say, you are gonna go with me to the library. And I talk to one of our librarians and they have to do a project where they gotta pick a topic and then they have to give me five uh, 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 articles in uh, journals and they have to give me books because I want them to start learning. You know, there was a time when you go, when I went to the library and he has these little cards. And again, I'm thinking about, I'm a baby boomer. So I remember all those steps. And I say, you have no idea the advantages you have. Now it's all there for you. All that you need is how to get there. So I trained them really early to start doing that. When they come into my research group, it's like you go to the website of the library and you have the opportunity to actually do this uh, on your own. And if you got any questions, yeah, I 
Moravians are willing to help. So that's a good way to do it. Now, once they already got information and they got the background, module number three is how they are going to start using the techniques and instrumentation. Because, of course, if you're going to do research and you are a first year student, you might be lacking a lot of techniques and information. Surprise, surprise, they learn real quick. And then the other students ahead, they are the instructors and the trainers. And they follow and they feel like, I'm owning this. Look, I can use the microbiome pit. I can do this. I can make dilutions. I can make all kinds of stuff. So it's important because then I start telling them about when you do your research, you're going to get data. You need to learn how you're going to write the information you're getting. And you're going to learn about the managing care of the instruments and particularly how they are going to do that research in terms of sampling techniques. So I train them to that. And what I do is every now and then, as a biologist, let's go out to the field. This is the name of this plant. If I want you to study the distribution, how would you do it? And I go away. You have one hour to answer that. And so you start training them to think and come up even with their own ideas, right or wrong. I don't care. I just want to see how they respond to the challenge. Now, this is the part that is really, it's, it's really hard on them. Because at this time, then I rely on the students ahead, like in the third year or even fourth year, they need to start making interpretations of that data so they can make conclusions. The first year students have the idea when you ask them a conclusion, I hated this lab, <laughs> or I didn't like this, or I didn't like that. And I say, that is not a conclusion, that is just your opinion, your feelings, which is good to understand when you make an assessment, how they feel is the level of satisfaction, but that is not a conclusion, that's how you feel, you go. But tell me, about the data, what are those numbers or the observations telling you? So they start building that and they start learning how to report that data are more important to make recommendations. And they can tell all the people, you know what, if you want to do this again, this is how you are going to do it. Or I should have done that in another way. So it's an important way to address that. Then at the end, it's important, and I like them, and I tell my students, what you are doing is not me doing. Oh, Professor, I thank you so much. I said, okay, thank you, but this is not me. This is not about me. This is about what you can do for yourself, and you have how many? If anybody, you have to start first looking at yourself in the mirror and say, thank you, I did it. You know, it's you, and then I tell them that you have to be an, an, an owner of what you do. I'm only a mentor, and I'm telling you, you know, you want to consider this, you want to consider that, but it's important that they get the ownership. And I want them to actually be, what I usually tell them, a citizen of science, that you can represent this important discipline and your own work. So when we apply all this model that uh, we have been using, we have come up about with a total of 17 COVID abstracts and 24 uh, presentations in national and international meetings. We have actually, I uh, forgot to include it here, two papers published in uh, peer review journals that are when uh, the students are first authors. So they really been, they have learned a lot. And part of 38 students and 38% have completed graduate and or professional degrees. 24% are still telling me I want to go back to school, I want to do this, and they're getting ready on it. A 38% are, are, are working in the industry and very successful. So we have really 
come out with a, a way to enhance a lot of RCN So When we look at the impacts of what we have actually done, one of the things that is, it is really interesting is that we are using what we have available. We are not a research campus. And then we have limited resources, but I have trained the students to actually use as much as they want that they can. We didn't have enough money at one time to actually buy uh, kind of particles that are really expensive. What did I do? I went to the field, I picked a lot of leaves out of one plant, and we made using green chemistry our own nanoparticles. I functionalized them, I characterized them. I made the recipe and the students are using it. So we make our own. It's the best way to actually do it. And I wanted them to learn that, to learn that even when we have limited resources, that is not an excuse to stop us to get engaged in research. And then I found out that this is a tremendous impact on curriculum development. And we actually link resources that we have and we use that directly into our research. The use of scientific literature for analysis and interpretation of research outcomes is, is incredible. How our students already know, I can go get an article and read about it and they come up, jump in the lab one day with, oh, guess what I found? And they tell me the story of what they are actually reading. I really wanted to make sure that we can use this model to actually enhance the learning experience in other areas as well. And one thing that is important in research, which I tell my students all the time, is that we need to start linking what we have with the rest of the world. That is really important. Their motivation gets really up there when they start doing this research, they want to make A's in the classes, they want to do this and that. And I think that uh, it's important to start making uh, partnerships between the institutions and the industries, because they have demands, they have needs, and we can be a good source. Then as recommendations that came out of all this is Important that we can incorporate this idea or this uh, model that we can make enhancements in the assessments of many science programs. Because I think that sometimes we don't know how to make an assessment. We don't know how we are going to start. And, we, and, and then as instructors, we forgot how important it is. And we get intimidated and we say, okay, what am I going to do? So it's important to start bringing new ways or new approaches into that. I think that we want to make sure that we continue doing support for undergraduate research experiences. I want also, I found out that we need to enhance the opportunities for us faculties to actually get more development uh, opportunities as we start working in, in, in our uh, duties on, on, on uh, different campuses. As I mentioned once, and I repeat it again, this liaisons with the industry and also private corporations is important. The students need to find out if they cannot move on into, uh, a, let's say, graduate school or professional school, that at least the experience at the undergraduate level can bring them to a good position that they can feel that they are really invested all their knowledge and experience in at that level. And of course, um, I'm crazy about the recruitment and retention of students. And I think that with this idea of incorporating research in the students' experiences, they really accomplish a lot. So I came up with a modification of that law of thermodynamics, and I call it my own law 
I don't know about of what I call assessment, it cannot be created nor destroyed, but can only be transformed. Why I started thinking about it, you know, I have a long drive coming from where I work and where I live. So in one hour and a half, I start thinking of things as I'm driving. And I said, you know what? We are born assessing things all the time. We are born putting things all together making analysis. So I believe that it is a natural thing. So it's already there. So it hasn't been created. And am I going to be able to destroy that? No, I can transform it. I can bring that into education. I can bring all that in my daily life. I can bring that everywhere. So this has been what we have done. And I really want to thank my students that has been incredible. If you ask me, how can you do that? How can you accomplish all that? Well, it's been 13 years. So we don't get any release time for doing this. We don't get any extra compensation. What we are doing is completely voluntary. The university can only give us support for the facilities. And if we need any instrumentation, they actually do. If we need some chemicals or some materials here and there, they always support us. But that's the only thing that they can really do. The rest is ours. And it has not stopped me for helping those students get the experience just using common things. It's just a matter of how I say, you need to learn how to cut your time in the right way. And I don't live near campus. I live an hour and a half away from campus. So I fly my time as long as the students, and we match our times and we match our experience. And the result is amazing. It's a great satisfaction. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity for being here. I hope that we woke up. <laughs> and if you got any questions, feel free, please. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. This is a Q&A time for them. Um, participants in the room, if you have any question, please say your name and institution for your question. Um, is there any question on the chat? No. Okay, is there any question here? Yes. Hi, Dr. Glenn Fulner from you Planner. Um, it's not much of a question, but I find your presentation very interesting. So, in high school in the United States, I'm a baby boomer too. I learned the library system. I, I, I was a history major. I had to, part of it was going into the library, learning about it. And it's interesting we've taken back to that level of having to learn the Dewey Decimal System and how the library works and how you research. And I think that is very, I found that very interesting because it creates critical thinking about how you have to find something, what you need to do. I also am interested in your assessment, analysis, and outcome, because that's part of what I do now. I mean, our, our applications are designed for people to do assessment, data analysis, and outcome management, which is basically what you're talking about. And I also see that what you're doing is giving them tools to be successful. Right? It's like the old analogy of give them a fish or teach them how to fish. Yeah. Right? right. You teach them how to fish, right? Mm -hmm. So they know. So the retention thing, I picked up on that. And if that impacted other areas of the institution, so they adopted that. Because what I'm seeing from you is you've come up with a, a process that you're applying to you know, specific area of the institution. It would seem that you know, from a retention standpoint, it might be a model to be able to use to drive higher retention and persistence because you know, be getting people involved. Part of the solution, what I heard is they, you know, you're creating a path to success. So it opens up this concept of, I want to, you know, when people are not, one of the people who are not successful is because they don't stick with it. They fall off, right? Why do they fall off? 
I can't, I don't understand it. I don't know what to do. No one's helping me get to where I need to be. I don't have the tools. And you're providing all that. So I'm wondering, is that translated into generally in the institution? Are they looking at this as a potential model? And the next question is, how would they track all of that? Yeah. We have right now uh, building up a particular center for, uh, for assessments. And it's run oh, by okay. Dr. Ramon uh, Torres. And he's actually uh, co authored with me with this. When I wrote this, I gave it to him for revision. And he came up screaming in my office, oh, this is assessment. So we have to use it. And then he is working with a recommendation to actually use it on campus for non science programs. He says that it has the ingredients that are needed to you know, incorporate this okay. in our courses and other lab experiences as well. So um, I have no clue what I was doing. You know, I, I, I didn't even know that I was doing an assessment. All I knew is I was able to score what I have done, what the students have done, and everything, how I really organize it. And this is what came up. And what is he using the assessment for? On, on campus? Yeah. Okay, right now we were using assessment for uh, uh, accreditation oh. and for also uh, curriculum reviews. Uh, and we are trying to determine uh, the effectiveness of some of the programs we have okay. because we are having students that are not really completing. Okay. And then we want to address what's really going on um, and see if any of these particular steps need some reinforcement or what kind of things we can observe in terms of so that. You're collecting data. Yes. And yes. how are you going to take advantage of that data to apply it? Is it mm -hmm. all done but manually? Is it done? I mean, because you're collecting it, then the, yeah. idea, the key is what do I do with this? It's going to be a big board thing. And then once it gets into that, on campus, we have a committee of academic affairs. Okay. And then that can come out to that particular committee. Yeah. And said, um, by the way, I'm the actual chair of that committee. And then what we do is we try to run the, EVA, uh, the results of the assessment Got it. and then try to get in touch with the ones running that particular program or this needs to be revised. And we just let them know one or less. So, so my other question is, mm -hmm. we, we, you could use that for recruitment. You understand how? Uh, we, oh, yeah. So yeah, the, per, the person you're recruiting, yeah. the parents. Yeah. If well, you address it to the parents, yeah. you can show, yes. if they come to your institution, mm -hmm. you're going to guarantee that their child is going to be get through the program. What the university does is that we have every year, at least once a, a year, we have like this big open house. Open, yeah. And then we have our students give demonstrations. Okay. And they even talk about the research Perfect. experiences. Uh, we are there with them, and then I have the chance to actually meet the parents. If they have any questions. Uh, and then it's so an existing student. Yes. And they talk about what yeah. they've done and why this. Yes. And then what we usually do is we keep a roster. And if they're interested, they sign with their email address. Believe me, next day we are texting. And they're interested in coming up and all that. And sometimes we invite them if they're really interested to come back for another visit. Mm -hmm. I have had students interested to come and, and, and visit the labs in a regular uh, period. They come up and they join the students actually working in the lab okay. or in a research experience. So I had a feeling of, of uh, what's going on. And then to make it more interesting, they have to wear a lab coat. And you know that means a uh, 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 lab coat. Oh. And you know that that makes them feel I'm already yeah. a scientist, yeah. you know. <laughs> it's you know, so it's kind of like yeah, I don't feel good. I'm wearing a lab coat. Oh, wow, that is 
It's really nice. Very, it's very interesting. That, yeah, because you, you got to think of out of the box. That's it. Yeah. Do you have published information? It's on the way to be published. We're talking about that. I would like to see it. Yeah. 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 It has very a lot of more details of what it's going to be. Yeah, it, just the way you looked at it, I thought it was the assessment aspect and then bruising. Very, very interesting. Sometimes is that we have a lot of them. Sorry, I'm from the same institution. Right. Sometimes we have a lot of faculty that they work on different projects and academic activities, and they don't know that what they're applying in the system. Because if it's not in the assessment plan, it's not assessment, you know. And they they see assessment like something forced on something that have to do. But when we see these type of assessment activities that it um, implies students from other programs, you see that they work more than what already was planned on the original assessment. Sometimes the problem is that we have this under-reporting problem that yes. the faculty are doing some work and they don't say what they're doing. Yeah, they right. The other thing you do is you create a common model mm -hmm. that can be adopted across the institution. Exactly. And therefore, you could have standards that the faculty all mm -hmm. adhere to. Exactly. That. So the reporting and the information has consistency because you're looking for certain things. You know, they may be different programs mm -hmm. and different things they're doing, but there's some consistency to how they're being measured, yeah. right? And that's the key, because then you have that that line, you know, you have something to work against. <laughs> I, I really find it interesting. I really like the story about taking them to the library. Oh, I, I honestly, <laughs> I, I, I heard it too, I heard that the library. Right? It, it's great because they, yeah. I bet you some of them never been in a library. You're right. They never go because right. on the internet, right? Yeah, they they don't understand. They're right. Yeah, yeah I know. Right. And, and with, the, uh, with the internet and the cell phone, yeah. They use it in my class. You really they use the cell phone in my class. They don't have time to actually call or talk to anybody. They have to use it for actually work on exercises when they got to use numbers. Uh, I made them use it. If I, I, I put a word that is really weird, I said, Okay, ask Mr. Google what do this means. Mm -hmm. Hello, incorporate it. I said, If you have it, use it. Will you actually use it with me in the class? I have no issues with the students being, no, they're always using it's it tool. for something. People. It's a tool, yeah. you know? And, and I think they understand that what we really want is that they are there. And they're really enjoying what they're doing. When I teach plants, I take them to a um, lagoon nearby campus. They love going there because they've got to get in the water. And they have forests of some weeds that we call thalassia. And they love getting there and finding things. And I started slowly introducing them to the environment. And this year, we are going to have a student coming from Louisiana. And we are going to have an exercise where they are going to use GPS. Use what? Uh, GPS and GPS. all these kind of satellite stuff to point at trees and plants that can be endangered when we have a hurricane. If, if they have a broken limb, if the plant is really weak or something like that. So we can make a map and tell the DRNA you have a lot of trees and you may lose, so if you cut that leaf at uh, this leaf right now, it can be better. And we want to bring that actually to the campus so they can actually work with all the trees on campus, the ones that can offer a challenge for people in terms of a hurricane. I have another exercise where we are going to use um, one of those robots that goes in the water and the students are going to make now the analysis of the Thalassia forest using a robot with a camera so they can see it and all that stuff. I like to bring new things. I don't like to teach the old traditional style. Uh, one time, I had the student go to an exercise in the supermarket. 
because I gave them a list of claims that they needed to identify and they needed to come back with a scientific name where the plant were coming from. Is it really a typical plant here in the island? Is it come from all the way? I mean, it's just different ways that they can apply how they actually do things. Because I think that, yeah, even when I take the boomer, but I really like this new thing, challenges, you know, so they can experience a lot of new things. I think it's really very interesting. You make learning entertaining. Yes, because otherwise they always keep telling people like a board. That's a that's a word that the new generation is I'm bored. Yeah, so I keep listening trash. to it all the time. I said, wrong with me, because if you want to be happy and be screaming and going places, John, I'm gonna get in that band or you're gonna go somewhere, or you're gonna learn this or you're gonna learn it that way. Because I think it's not that we don't want to teach is that sometimes we don't know how to address that issue or, or, or this is not good. And then we just feel confused. And before you know the semester is over. So you feel I haven't done much. So I anticipate and I plan that way. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.